from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, good afternoon everyone, and thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'm Mary Jane Deeb, uh, Chief of the African Middle East Division. I'd like to welcome you all in our reading room and for a fascinating program, uh, first of its kind, um, on Persian mystical literature. And it's going to be, um, as you see, it's, it's going to be very, very special. It's different from anything else that we've done before in this reading room. As most of you already know, our division, the African Middle East Division, is made up of three sections. The African section, the Near East section, the Hebraic section. And together, we're responsible for 78 different countries of the world, the whole continent of Africa, the whole Middle East. We stretch to Afghanistan, to Central Asia, because we're divided on the basis of language, not of politics. And we have a Hebraic section as well that includes not only uh, the State of Israel, but also the Hebraic uh, world beyond it. What we do is we develop the collections from all these countries, and we also serve our patrons who are doing research on these collections. We try to let people know what we have, and we've got treasures. We've got treasures uh, that come from all over, and we try to make them available uh, to patrons as they come and do research. We also um, display them. Sometimes they're just short displays that we do on a table, and sometimes they are much bigger exhibits. And uh, Today uh, we have, it's, it's related to the program of today, we have a magnificent exhibit out there on the same floor on the other side on a thousand years of the Persian book. And if you haven't seen it, you should go. It's, it's open until the end of September anyway. Um, among other things, uh, we also bring scholars uh, who have written scholars who are experts in a particular field to share with us their knowledge, their expertise, the work they have done, to share it not only with us as librarians, but also with our patrons and with guests and visitors who come to our division. So today, the program that we have is organized in, in partnership with the Roshan Institute for Persian Studies at the University of Maryland and co-sponsored with the Poetry and Literature Center here at the Library of Congress. The Roshan Institute, and more specifically, its dynamic director, Fatima Keshavars, have been our partner in both the spectacular exhibit on a thousand years of the Persian book, and as well on a unique six-month program of lectures and symposia on the Persian book. The programs that have already taken place have been amazing, and we have received a lot of, uh, a lot of positive feedback from people who have attended them. The Poetry and Literature Center has always been very active and has been our partner, uh, active partner today. And you can hear me? Yes? Not only today, with this uh, particular program uh, of Persian literature and, and music, but on a different uh, program, a uh, lecture and, uh, and videotape series on African poets and writers. It's called Conversations with African Poets and Writers. And those programs are up uh, on our website. So I want both to uh, thank the head of our Poetry and Literature Center, Rob Casper, who is here with us and has been a wonderful partner, and very much Fatima Keshavaz, who has been sent, you know, on the wings of poetry, however you want, 
from St. Louis to Washington just to be our partner in, a, in this, in this uh, extraordinary programs that we have set up. And now to introduce the poet and the singer in today's program is Hirad Dinavari. Uh, he is the Persian uh, area specialist here uh, in this division and he really has been the creator, the originator, the, the force behind uh, this exhibit of a thousand years of the Persian book. He has been on the move for the past couple of years, I would say, and uh, things are just getting faster and faster for him. Uh, but Hirad Dinavari is really one of uh, the, the best Persian specialists you could possibly have and I'm very grateful he's with us. So Hirad will be introducing now uh, the participants in the program. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary Jane. Uh, none of this would be possible without a chief that is supportive. So thank you. Uh, it wouldn't have happened without your assistance and help and your mentorship. Thank you. Um, I don't want to take too much time, but we have two very distinguished uh, guests here. Uh, Dr. Fatima Keshavarz and um, uh, composer um, Jessica Kenny. I'm going to quickly give you a brief uh, background on them. And I also want to personally thank Dr. Keshavarz for helping me uh, when it came to the exhibition uh, and I needed some assistance with the manuscripts. Um, she has a background in Persian manuscripts. Without her assistance, uh, it would have been difficult to be able to give you the level of uh, detail that, that you see in the exhibit. Um, Dr. Uh, um, Fatima Keshavar was born and raised in the city of Shiraz in Iran. She completed her, city, her studies in the Shiraz University and the University of London. She taught at Washington University in St. Louis over 20 years where she chaired the Department of Asian and Near Eastern Languages and Literatures from 2000 to 2011. In 2012, uh, Dr. Keshavaz joined the University of Maryland as the Roshan Institute Chair of Persian Studies and as the Director of Roshan Institute for Persian Studies. Um, Dr. Keshavaz is an author uh, and award-winning um, award books including Mystical Lyric, uh, The Case of Jalaluddin Rumi, um, Recit uh, in the Name of the Red Rose, uh, and um, a book of literary analysis and social commentary titled Jasmine and the Stars, uh, reading more than Lolita in Tehran. She has also published, um, over, published other books and numerous uh, journal entries. Uh, I also want to say that uh, she herself is a poet. She writes poetry in Persian, but also in English. And she's been featured on our poetry program here uh, at, at the library, um, where she recited her own uh, English poetry. And uh, also, her, she has a forthcoming book on Sadi, which is about to be published. And we will have a book signing for that event when, once the book is uh, out. Um, and uh, it's truly an honor to have her here uh, really uh, speaking and showcasing the beauty and the genius of uh, the Persian culture, which is li really its literary uh, tradition. Um, also, I have to say I have a very soft spot for uh, people who go out of their way um, and learn a whole new repertoire. Uh, the artist, singer, and composer Jessica Kenny, who is here with us, we are honored to have her, uh, is obviously of American background, and like a number of scholars and researchers that we have here who are not of Persian uh, origin, who have really gone out their way to learn, uh, you know, the culture of a different place, Jessica um, herself uh, has traveled a very interesting path. Um, her background is essentially, um, she caters to um, multiple different audiences uh, of vastly different musical forms. She has integrated uh, a distinct style that is a fusion, a, a reverence for and interpretation of Southeast Asian and Persian vocal traditions has formed the basis for uh, the main improvisational work that she does. Uh, simultaneously, um, uh, an ongoing series of collaborations with her husband, composer, violinist, um, Mr. Kang, 
uh, have, have also resulted in her embracing the avant-garde audience. Um, in uh, 2014, she received the James W. Ray Distinguished Artist Award for the Washington State Artist, uh, whose work uh, demonstrates uh, exceptional originality. And she and Mr. Kang were recipients of the 2013 Stranger Genius Award in music. Presently, um, Ms. Kenny uh, studies the Radif with Ostad Hossein Omumi and Persian language and literature at the University of Washington and, uh, and avidly reads interpretations of classical Sufism. Um, upcoming works include collaborations on Rumi with Dr. Keshavars, uh, Chinese text translator Red Pine and contemporary poet Anne Carson. So as you see, a very talented and very, very versatile artist herself. I have two very distinguished, lovely people, and I'm not going to take any further time. Please join us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary Jane and Hirad, for this gracious introduction and for making this event possible. It's very, very special to both of us. And um, the library is a very special place for us. So as much as um, you're graciously acknowledging our help, we are delighted to be here and to really be a part of all of this. Yes, thank um, you so much. So what Jessica and I will do today um, is to spend a little bit of time um, bringing out some of the specific, specific features of um, Persian poetry and music and then follow it up with a, a performance uh, so that hopefully that will um, um, lower. <laughs> okay, so that um, Hopefully that will um, give you an idea of um, what exactly, you know, in theoretical terms we may be talking about. Um, the main theme really for us has always been uh, the very close interrelation between poetry and music. Um, of course you can say this about many art forms. Um, not just in the Persian tradition, in many other traditions, but definitely in the Persian tradition. Um, the book Illumination, for example, uh, shows in architecture, the same designs show in carpet weaving, um, and many other uh, similar situations. So people were really inspiring each other in many different ways, and um, it led to um, further creativity in other branches of art. But it was so important that poetry and music, that the, the close connection would be acknowledged, that poets, uh, there were poets like Rudaki and uh, Jami, um, two really master well-known poets, who were actually known as musicians. Now, in some cases, poets were acknowledged as musicians, but we cannot historically prove it, but it, even that shows that this was so important. Um, when I was looking for material, I, I, I've all, all also noticed something interesting, which is in pre-Islamic Iran, you usually have references to musicians, but not poets. But they were singing their own poetry. So in a way, the profession of being a musician and a poet was very interconnected. Um, so musicians, high, highly skilled and trained musicians are expected to actually know poetry very much because poetry with its very precise mathematical um, count of short and long syllables is very much the foundation of the musical forms. Now, as we will talk about and you'll see in some of the examples, 
this can be stretched. Like in any other art form, you struggle with it, you engage it, you make it, you, you um, use it as a challenge to open it up. Um, so it's not, if it becomes a prison for you, then it's, then it's the wrong thing, the wrong way of using it. Um, I'm also very impressed with the fact that one of the greatest philosophers um, known in the, the uh, Iran and Islamic um, era, um, with a specific attention to music, Farabi, um, he thought that the art of singing poetry to music was the most perfect art. They described it as the most perfect art. I also remember, even as a child growing up in Shiraz, that my father's library had these books of poetry with specific notes on which azal was suitable for which mode of music. So it was very much something that, um, that was understood, that the musical structure is rooted in the prosodic structure. And when you look at the bigger um, structures in music, they're known as modes or dast goths, that have within them smaller uh, units, known as gouche, um, the relationship between the gouche and the dast goth, in terms of structure, in terms of its mood, in terms of its color and texture, is very much like having a verse from a ghazal of a bigger poem and the connection that that verse has to the ghazal. So it's kind of reciprocates that. And I, I remember that Jessica and I, were, when we were talking about this, you were telling me about, I think it was Kereshme. Right, uh, the gouche of Kereshme, which uh, in the case of the daska of Homayun, is a, you can call it a closed gouche, meaning that there is a specific rhythm where the, the poetry and the melody both emphasize that rhythm. So it shows that reciprocal relationship. Um, and in this case, it was uh, what, I, what I learned from Ostad Omumi was uh, a poem of Hafez. He selected that poem with this particular rhythm to bring that melody to life, this, this closed gouche. So, uh, the rhythm of that is tatan, tatan, tatatan, tan, tatan, tatan, tan, tan. Biya vokash diya manda shate sharab and And then when you combine that with the melody, Biya vokash diya manda shate sharab and خروش و ولبل در جان شیخ و شاب انداز مرا به کشتی باده در افکن ایساقی که گفته ام نکویی کن و در آب now tell me, how can I match that? <laughs> okay. I feel completely different to sing that poetry in Dr. Keshavar's presence and in a very knowledgeable group. I, I can really sense um, many layers of this kind of poetry right. and it draws me deeper into it. So I right. and thank I you so much for that. I think that it would be very um, appropriate to say that Jessica is really an example of that musician that's deeply rooted in the literature. So every word, every syllable, every um, twist and turn, she just wants to have experience it, and that's why we can get all these different layers. And as we were talking about that, actually, it reminded me, and I was telling her, that sometimes the same kind of rhythm, even without music, is being um, recreated in the poetry itself. For example, um, I'll give you an example Rumi is talking about in a very happy day. He says, you know, you may be happy, but I'm happier than you a thousand times. Who, who did I dream of last night? I really don't know. I, you know so, and then I, I'm so happy I don't fit in this world. 
And still, I am not, you know, I'm, I'm hidden from the eyes of the world, but I'm filling the world. And then he gets this idea, if the tree was not rooted in the earth, it would be following me to get, you know, this happiness from me. And then he does it with the, with the words, Hoshi, Hoshi, to vali man hazal, chandanam, bechab dush, keral didam, nemidanam. The hosteli yo tarab, dar jahan nemigonjam, vali ze cheshme jahan, hamchuru, penhanam. The rachtagar, nabodi, pao begel, maro justi. So the whole flowers, the trees, they just want to come to me because I have that happiness. And then he's in a, you know, the next day, two days later, he is in a, he's had a night vision. I mean, that, that's the only thing I can say about this poem. And actually, Jessica and I are going to perform this poem to her beautiful sound building of the sound under it, um, which is, in which Rumi is hearing the sound of the drum. It's time to leave. We are all on a journey. We have to be ready for this. And then you can hear it. You can hear it. Ay av shahan, ay av shahan, hengal makub shastas jahan, dargub shajal nam nilasar, tabler rahi las asman. In bang ha as pish o pas, banger rahi las do jaras, har lahza i nafs o nafas, and then you can really enter this night and you see the stars and the candles and you know the, the drape the blue drapes of the skies and the beings that come out from behind the curtains it's totally unbelievable but you may not even if you don't know a word of the music um, you can feel it in the sound and I, and I remember when um, Jess and I were talking about that. Um, I think you were saying something about how that could be reciprocated in a binary fashion with... Yes, because of this, uh, the two columns of the ghazal, mm -hmm. you have this kind of question and response, or call and response, question and answer, and that's such a fundamental musical principle. So it, they kind of mirror each other and, and support the meaning of that that you might make a statement of some kind and then complete it, or even uh, propose some kind of a, a mystery or a riddle and then give some hint to what that is. Or, and you can hear the drama of this also in the melodies. Right, and then um, there was an instance where it was absolutely beautiful that you were showing how in fact the second half is problematizing things. It's like that's from the calmness of the your question, you go into the more heightened um, sense. So it could be, it's not, you sometimes get the question and the answer, but you sometimes you get the question and you get another question. You don't necessarily always get the answer there, so it could be, a, could be very much a challenge. Right, that's true. Yeah. Right. I don't know if you wanted to, to, to show that or should we... Uh, because I'm, I may be thinking things that, you know, that may not be at the yeah, front of your thoughts. I'm not sure what, what right, exact okay. melody that so, was. But actually that leads me to the other thought that we had that at the bottom of all of this, because we have been talking about order and structure and question and answer, really at the bottom of all of this is an impulse to subversion. You... The, the, the energy comes from opening everything up, questioning everything. Like there's this famous um, piece in the, in the Masnavi where the king buys this beautiful slave girl. The slave girl is not paying attention to him because he's in fact in love with um, someone else, a goldsmith from her hometown. In the end, she gets sick, a physician comes there, and the physician discovers that she's in love. And so we get a real beautiful um, discussion of love. What, what is love? It's an ailment that there's no way to describe it. It's also a cure. We go on and on and on about that. But then just as we get to what is the description of love? The pen breaks, and the piece of paper is torn into pieces. 
So in the end, all the description is to say it cannot be described. And I think this uh, really, um, this stretching of the concept, that, yeah. Right, and, and we were also talking about stretching in terms of time. Oh, yeah. So music okay. can take, uh, when that breakdown occurs, when, when language breaks down, the music can keep carrying that atmosphere and that feeling. Um, and sometimes the music itself will go in and break down the poetry or will extend a syllable. And suddenly how we perceive a moment, what is a word? How long do we have to perceive the meaning of a specific word. Mm -hmm. So actually the music can support uh, more contemplation and also just the presence of that meaning. Um, I, I thought of one example for that, which uh, also is in, in the um, Daska of Homayun. Tomumi binio ma Because when you have the phrase like "tomu mi vino man pi cheshemu," you're looking at the hair and looking at all the curls and all the details, all the beauty of the hair, and then "or" oh, the phrase "or" oh, is "and." It really doesn't have that much grammatical weight, but music stretches it. "Tomu mi vino," and you really have to wait until. What is the next thing that is given instead of the move, which is the more in-depth look at it? So I think that's a, that's a beautiful example of a stretching a strand of hair. Right, and a little different than emphasizing a term. Right. Really, right. it has the subversive quality that you're describing. Right, right. So right. what is going to happen? It's suspenseful, and it's also mm -hmm. leaving you in the lurch, and, and then also it's saying, you can look more deeply. There's something there. There's right. a curl, there's a, a gesture, there's a sign. Right, absolutely. And um, particularly if you put that in the context that you know, then the hair um, symbolizes, I, I, I really am hesitating to use the word symbolizing, but kind of re represents the, the multiplicity of our, of our experiences of mm -hmm. the world. So in the bigger context of the mystical tradition, then it just has layer upon layer of meaning. And um, we have often talked about in our, in our practices and so on, on what is it that gives this poetry and music this amazingly central place in the Persian tradition? And I think we have, in our own little way, come to the conclusion that this is because this experience isn't just informative of something, it's constitutive of it. It rebuilds you, it opens you up for ways of reimagining yourself, for new ways of being in the world, if you like, that is so um, substantial rather than just being, a, you know, listening to something that is you being informed of, which is, of course, one aspect of it. And again, if you look at the Rumi um, tradition, you see, he says, you know, look at the children, they have, they have nothing but a thought of food and comfort, and they grow older, and they get all the perceptions and all the thoughts, and then they grow older, and then King Love comes and says, what is this? I want a palace. 
and breaks them apart and rebuilds them into a palace. So in a metaphorical way, the idea is that this speaking could be the process of deconstructing for the reconstruction that needs to happen in our life. I know that we want to get closer to the actually uh, performing, but let me just say that we were both saying yesterday that we hope that we perform in that very spirit of just opening up and getting ready for seeing the world new to the best of our abilities. And um, also seeing the connection between the outer and the inner, which is something that the mystical tradition and Rumi seems to do so well. And there's, a, there's an, another quatrain which we will perform together, um, in which Rumi says, um, and so I basically I melted in the sea of purity like salt. Nothing remained. Doubt, faith, uh, certainty, infidelity, nothing remained. And a star appeared in the center of my being. And the seven heavens got drowned in that one star. So it's a process of going out there and coming back in, which also has its own um, adapt, if you like. I think for the, for the uh, want of a better translation, the rules and regulations of how to deal with it, but also how to break the rules and regulations. And we were discussing adab as a natural order like, as well, and, and how the poetry and the music actually can be seen in terms of some greater natural order that they mirror or echo and that guide their uh, creative um, path, impulse. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so with that, we're going to um, do uh, some rabais, um, two of Rumi and one of Atar. And that's in Sega, okay?
changes into simply flowing and he's cultivating his garden and he's talking to the trees. He's one of the trees sometimes. The beloved is another one. And so um, you hear the, in some of the other ghazals, you hear the rhythm of the breeze and the flow of the singing stream rather than the drum beat that we were hearing earlier. So we will, we're going to just walk into one such drum and hope you will follow.
Thank you for an amazing performance um, and poetry. It's just breathtaking. Uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to get up. If you don't mind, I'm going to take one of these microphones and take it to the audience. Perfect. Uh, all right. Uh, Matthew will do that. And um, we are essentially recording everything. Therefore, if you ask a question or make a comment, be aware that uh, we have the right to subsequently put this on our website and show it as a webcast. Uh, in case you don't want your question to be online, then uh, refrain from asking questions. Thank you. But don't be afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, this is an amazing response. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You want to keep the feeling, and we really deeply appreciate that. But if you want to say something, feel free. I, no, I just want to know if you're going to do this again. <laughs> We're doing a CD together. It's outstanding. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're actually working on a CD together, and you know, we, I think that the performance is so constitutive for both of us to be able to share this feeling and explore new poetry. And we did, in an, on another recent occasion, we did some poetry of Farouk Zad, and it was just an amazing, different kind of experience. So it's, um, it's, it's very important to us. And, and very, sure. yes. Now, what Thank you for noticing. <laughs> it's amazing to have the opportunity of this kind of. Uh, uh, can is this all right? Because I think this is yeah. recording. Okay. No, this is for the recording. Oh, okay. Uh, it's such a great opportunity to have this context of voice on voice to really show those subtle parts of the voice, whereas I think in many. Um, other contexts for singers, we need to represent a certain kind of timbre or certain things. So this is a really amazing, um, for me, very creative feeling, creative space to play with all the different timbres. And um, of course, uh, my background, I've, also, I've studied Javanese singing um, since I was 19 or 20, and uh, that's a very different timbre. And, um, the whole emphasis on that timbre is to blend your voice with these tuned metallophones. So you have these harmonic mm -hmm. structures that are really rich and bringing out a bright timbre is so important. Um, I have a friend here who sings this music as well. Um, so it's, that's really particular. And, and also, um, the, of course, the Avaz, Persian vocal technique, is, is very rigorous. and really something like a, a whole body experience because you have this rupturing of the tone that happens that the emotion can come through in um, called the tahrir. It's like this breaking sound. And, and then of course the, the tonalities are also, um, you could describe it as microtonal, um, having quarter tones or um, you know, very specific tuning. So these are things I, I really love, and I, I feel it's in all, these things are found in all vocal music, but it's certain traditions have really developed the language and the ideas about that, so we can really uh, explore them even more consciously. But thank you for asking. It was wonderful. I was so <laughs> emotional. Thank you. I'll just <clears throat> I'm so 
was, I was wondering how did you meet and how long did you practice it together? What an amazing ex experience for us. Thank you so thank much. You. Oh, thank you. Actually, um, I met Jessica first on celebration of Rumi's birthday in 2007 in the Afghan embassy, and where she sang there, and where um, many friends, including my lovely and loving friend Nasreen, who's sitting there, was present. And um, you know, it was an amazing from close by hearing her sing. Um, that was when that was the 800th birthday of Rumi, and I remember that when they ordered the cake, the the um, bakers for the <laughs> the bakers exactly <laughs> called in and said, um, "There is an extra zero here," and I didn't realize because it was 800th birthday. Rumi's happy. <laughs> <and 800th> birthday. <laughs> and, and so it was on the 800th birthday of Rumi that we first met. <laughs> that's and true. That's true, yes. And um, you know, it just was um, one of those instances where you can see someone else is exploring so brilliantly a different aspect of what you love so much. And so we kind of, uh, I think, continue to do that. And hopefully we'll continue. Thank you so much. It was very sweet. I'm not sure. Because 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 I'm not sure. I really can't tell you how much this affects me. I have uh, watched uh, the two of them at a big roomy uh, gathering that they had for the National Geographic a few years ago, and I was just moved to tears. Um, that also accompanied music and uh, Maestro Umumi as well. Mm -hmm. I really hope that these series continue. Uh, it would be wonderful if we have it here, but also in other venues. And uh, I think really this captures the essence of Persian culture, the beauty of it. It's the spiritual, the poetic, the literary, and the um, universal, you know, Jahan um, Shumul, as we say in Farsi. Um, if there is any more comments or questions, feel free to ask or state. <laughs> and then with this, I want to thank you very much for all coming, especially on a rainy day like this during the week. It's quite an honor. Thank you. Go ahead. I have a question specifically for Dr. Keshavar. Yeah, uh, you, you uh, made mention of the power that the Adab has to, uh, I think the phrase you used, mm -hmm. open and reconfigure our mm -hmm. subjectivities and uh, possibilities for being in the world, to use something of a public yeah. kind of phrase. I'm wondering if, uh, from your perspective, there's something inherently confessional and individual about that? process, or if it is something that indeed might have a collective uh, dimension. In here, I think of the manifold political uses, which in this mm -hmm. country mm -hmm. alone, this material mm -hmm. has been a very interesting political uh, occurrence. Right. right. Actually, it's very interesting that we've had this conversation with Jessica, that um, the one thing that happens so beautifully in this poetry and I'm sure it happens in a lot of good poetry in many different traditions, but it, it, it allows you to move between the inter individual and the collective. You, you, you're not supposed to be so individual that you keep everything to yourself. And then you're not supposed to so dissolve in the community that nothing remains of you, so of your own uh, being. And so I think what the the way I, uh, and this is a phrase that actually a dear colleague used, Michael Sells once, who was a great scholar of mystical literature. It's the space that the poetry provides. It's kind, kind of, um, we were saying it's like a third space. It's you, it's the world, and it overlaps. So you go in there and you can say that you couldn't say, things that you couldn't say before. You can think the thoughts you couldn't think before. and 
that that's what the poetry does. It allows you, it gives you the, the voice to formulate, but in your own way. And it is, I mean, it, actually we had this conversation in the car this morning as we were coming, that um, is some of the things that they're referring to totally abstract or could be applied to individuals. And you know, my answer to that is, it depends on whether it's Wednesday or Thursday. Are you, where are you in your life? Because you are the catalyst that makes that meaning happen. That space is there. You can go in that space and explore. I don't know if you want to add. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming, Dr. Keshavars, uh, Ms. Kenny. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, I hope you go and see the exhibition for those of you who haven't seen it. And do come back to the rest of the program. Some will be here, some will be at the University of Maryland. I think the next one is Dr. Um, uh, Masume Farhad, am oh, I correct? Yes. From the, uh, the that, curator from That would the, be fantastic. Yes. So don't miss it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the curator from the Sackler Freer's Islamic and um, yes. Middle Eastern, Near Eastern collections. Thank you very much. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.